so therefore you, the contention is that if the physics of an uh, electromagnetic or a um, laser oriented therapy mm -hmm. uh, could bring up the T cell counts and, and truly eradicate the Well, body? the question is will it eradicate the virus first off, which I think that it will if it's developed. And then the question would be, could the body reconstitute itself once the virus was eliminated? And that, I don't know, because I think it depends upon how far the virus has destroyed the immune system. It's clear that T cell counts can go very low and then reconstitute themselves, because they do that with various other viral diseases, particularly with mono or measles or a host of different virus diseases. It's known that they can virtually drop your T counts down into the teens, but then the body reconstitutes itself and T, T cell counts return. Now, the question is, can that same phenomena occur with AIDS? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody has that answer. Um, well, of course, one of the interesting questions would be, where do these T cell counts, where do the T cells regenerate from? Um, in a grown adult where thymic tissue is supposedly remnant or destroyed, where are the T cells being matured? Where do they well, get there? Um, well, just the thymus, the thymus <coughs> gland is, is the place where the, the T cells are originally. Right, but those are supposed to, the thymus is supposed to involute and be, you know, virtually non-existent in adults. So in adults, where do T cells mature and gain their T cell maturation, their characteristics, if the thymus is gone, in a sense? That's one of the questions I think needs answering. Well, do you feel that there will ever be an eradication of AIDS? No, not, not to where we're going. Everything that's been done has been done uh, simply fosters the spread of this disease, and we've done nothing whatsoever to control it. In fact, every, ver every measure for control of this epidemic, in my opinion, has been uh, set aside, and every measure that's been affected has been, uh, in a sense, affected and almost help spread the disease. So uh, I don't personally see, short of a out-and-out -out cure, um, that this disease will be eradicated. And this disease has the potential to exterminate mankind, the AIDS virus by itself, without considering any of its relatives, all of which have equal potential. So we're looking at uh, viruses, a host of viruses, each of which has the potential to exterminate mankind. So they must be cured, and relatively quickly. So we're looking at a, a very uh, highly misdirected attempt in the sense that drugs or vaccines simply uh, cannot be developed for the, for the AIDS virus because the AIDS virus tends to mutate around treatments and the fact that there are well, well, virtually I think you would have trouble convincing doctors that it's misdirected because that's been their standard therapy for the last hundred years. But, of course, in my opinion, it's misdirected. And, uh, and that doesn't mean that you should drop all those uh, uh, research projects and, and just turn entirely to something else. But what I think should be the case is that there should be a host of other uh, research projects undertaken. And those would include the, the actual physical um, process of exterminating these viruses with physical characteristics, uh, particularly electromagnetic radiation and any other any other mechanism that appears at all feasible must be investigated. Now, uh, would you uh, put those under the mechanisms of present science? No, absolutely not, because uh, I think science is not capable of policing itself adequately and and um, you know, by and history, right, right, judging by the present history particularly, uh, I wouldn't give the control of these mechanisms over to the same people who, in my opinion, made this disease. So that's one exception that, that I find distinct, you know, as a, to the approach. Well, is it true that every AIDS virus that is found in a person that walks in off the street is unique to the host body? That Absolutely. Is Absolutely, which makes the development of vaccines very difficult. And uh, one of the reasons that it will be uh, virtually impossible to develop a vaccine against this virus, plus the fact that the virus is transferred by cells primarily rather than by the virus itself, makes uh, development of vaccines also very difficult. In other words, in my opinion, uh, and I, I've said this since the 1980s, 
uh, that this disease could kill you entirely without ever being exposed. In other words, you would never have to see a free AIDS virus in the body for the AIDS virus to exterminate you. So what good would a vaccine be? How does a vaccine work? It works externally. This virus works internally. It works inside of cells, and it's transferred by cells that, uh, in a sense, have intercourse. So the AIDS virus is totally capable of exterminating you without ever being exposed externally or outside of the cell or environment. So it can avoid uh, treatment by hiding inside the host cell? Absolutely. It does, yeah. That's the end of my questions here. Um, go back to these notes here. Um, well, getting back to the idea that um, uh, this being uh, an establishment created or accidentally or intentionally created disease. Uh, one example that could be uh, shown as a parallel would be the, um, the study of black men in Tuskegee, Alabama. Oh, there's a host of examples. I mean, uh, there are literally hundreds of cases of experimentation on humans without their knowledge or consent, documented in a series of books, such as A Higher Form of Killing by Paxman and Harris, Clouds of Secrecy by Leonard Cole from Princeton, uh, The Killing Winds by Jean McDermott, which are just some of the standard texts that talk about biological warfare experiments conducted on humans. In this country specifically, you can address the Tuskegee study, which was conducted by the CDC in the open medical literature for 40 years or more, where black men uh, were uh, infected with syphilis, were watched, and then uh, actually when penicillin became available for treatment, they were specifically prevented from being treated uh, so that they could observe the progression of the disease in them. So it's the infliction of disease upon uh, members of our society by the CDC. Uh, that was uh, revealed in 1972, not that long ago, if you remember. The same exact year, in my opinion, that uh, scientists were saying, let's make a selective T-cell destroying virus. So there's plenty of precedent as far as uh, infliction of disease upon people here without anybody speaking up. And other examples would be in Hanford, Washington, where radioactivity was released in the atmosphere over 30 years over in the past uh, by nuclear physicists there. That was our plutonium extraction plant, where now uh, many of the single-sided steel containers containing radioactive byproducts are leaking into the environment. And two of those uh, containers are critical, are ready to go critical. In other words, a potential nuclear explosion can occur up there at any time and contaminate massive portions of the northwest portion of this country. Now, those experiments were conducted for 30 years or more, and also there nobody ever spoke up and said, you know, why are we having so many cases of leukemia or, you know, birth defects in the surrounding community? But it was known that they were releasing those radioactive particles into the environment by the people who, were, who lived in Hanford. Well, it, it always seems to kind of go back to the, to the defense industry or the military, and there's, there's a big history of showing how uh, the, content the contention is that you can't separate the study for defense against diseases without studying the offense. Oh, the obviously, offense. right, of course, that's true. But, um, you know, that, that brings up the question uh, of, of, what, of what extreme, you know, are you going to, it's like, well, the, the therapy was a success, but the patient died. I mean, what good is all this if the country dies? I don't see that, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, the same thing is true, of course, is that's what, in my opinion, that's what happened in Russia. What happened was Chernobyl, the, f the people finally realized that the government was not out working in their best interest, could not protect them against itself. Now, the, the, the decline of communism was as much due to that fact as, w as well as to the economic reality that it was a total failure. So um, when the people realized that the two basic tenets of communism, one was you'll always have a job, and two, we'll protect you, and that, in fact, the government was helping to exterminate its own population. And then the people finally said, hey, wait, 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 I'm, you know, I'm not quite willing to accept this. Well, I, I think that in this country we're a long ways from that realization, but, but in the past some of the experiments would clearly indicate the same kind of thinking. Well, uh, being the disease that it is, wouldn't somebody have noticed that had this disease got out into the general populace that it would have created... A habit that we haven't known yet. I mean, this is, well, this is sure. playing God almost. 
Well, there have been numbers. I mean, there are whole books written on that uh, also, on who should play God. Uh, I can direct you to any number of those. In, in fact, one entitled, Who Should Play God. Uh, the question of who put this disease where, uh, or the question of how does the epidemic occur, is, of course, the most interesting part, but the least, that, the least definable. Uh, what's most definable and, and most clear-cut is how the disease occurred, in my opinion. But the question of exactly how did it occur where is, is, is still, you know, a little murky. I mean, everybody has their own opinion, and there's a great deal of evidence to back up all kinds of opinions, from population control to biological warfare to simply an accident, and, you know, on and on and on. All of those uh, can be argued very effectively. Right. It, well, I've seen a number of cases where there were fingers pointed at uh, the National Cancer Institute, which is known as Fort Detrick. Or well, the Fort D actually, Fort Detrick is an integral part of the NCI, which is a much bigger institution. But it is an integral part of it. Okay. And uh, that being the, uh, one, the Center for Experiments in Biological Warfare, one would be apt to deduce that this is possibly where it was created, in a, in a lab. Oh, I don't think so. I, I think we have clear-cut evidence that the disease was produced in a cow, you know, in, in, in this country, in, in Louisiana, in the late 60s. I, I don't see that as being uh, any question. But the question of who, uh, you know, who then took it and used it in different places is, is totally another uh, scenario. And so I don't think that you should look for Fort Detrick necessarily as the guys who created it. But maybe they used it. I can't say. You know, that, that's a different question entirely. Plus, this disease uh, was available to virtually everyone. It isn't just the United States, again. I mean, all the biological warfare institutes around the world, particularly Pasteur Institute, which is, of course, the Biological Warfare Center of France, and uh, that, in my opinion, explains why they have such an interest in this. Porton Down, which is the Biological Warfare Center of England. Ivanovsky Institute, which is the Biological Warfare Center of Russia. And Tokyo. I mean, all of these places had this virus in the early 70s. So you can't just look to the United States and say, we're the sole perpetrators of this problem. Now, you mentioned Louisiana in the 60s? Yeah, the late 60s. Yeah. The virus, uh, as far back as we could track it, that was the original cow, was from Louisiana. Louisiana State Agricultural Farm. It was just a virus that was extracted from the cow at the time. I see. Now, and, you, and the contention is that this cow had a virus that already had combined leukemia virus with the sheep. The, yeah, it? right, specifically, yeah. In other words, it, it had a, this cow had a virus that was, in a sense, bovine, was, in fact, bovine visna virus, which destroyed the cow and which was still, at that time, probably restricted to growth in cattle, the same as any other cow virus today grows more or less selectively in cattle. And the species barrier, which prevents us from being infected with any kind of virus, uh, particularly cow or simian or any other, would have protected us from being infected with that virus. What then is required, in my opinion, was the laboratory manipulation of the virus, growing it in human tissue and artificially adapting it to humans, which would have created the human AIDS virus. I see. Interesting. You know, I haven't heard that, that uh, uh, supposition before. That's interesting. Uh, Which one? The one, the whole, you know, the Louisiana, late 60s. Oh, Start well. Time I've oh. Come across that. Um, um, how easy would it be to, to infect uh, a large number of vaccines? Say it, say it's very it, easy. I mean, does the WHO prepare like a, a giant vat? or like, say, you know, millions of people in one? Well, if you look at smallpox, it was prepared in 64 different countries, as I recall, and, you know, literally hundreds of different laboratories. Uh, cows were directly used for the preparation of the smallpox vaccine. Any of those vaccine preparations in any of those countries could potentially have been contaminated, the ones that were used in Africa. So that was a very big project, and whether it was accident or intentional. Intentional contamination could have occurred at any of those sites. The same as accidental contamination could have occurred at any of those sites. 
it's well known, as stated by Cedric Mims in 1971 or two when writing in Microbiological Reviews. He said that bovine visna virus was a known contaminant of fetal calf serum, uh, cow calf serum. That was in the early 70s, and fetal calf serum was being used to grow tissue cultures. So that means that a virus virtually identical to AIDS virus was contaminating the growth media that was used in cultures worldwide in the early 1970s. Worldwide? Worldwide. This, this was not like one instance in one lab that he found? Not one instance. And I'm talking about virtually every laboratory in the world was using fetal calf serum to stimulate growth in their tissue cultures. So a virus virtually identical to AIDS was being poured into every tissue culture in the world in the early 70s. Still is today, in general. Wow. And nobody noticed, nobody... Lots of people noticed, but nothing was done about it. The same as the French contaminated the hemophiliacs with AIDS, known AIDS-contaminated blood products, known contaminated Tissue products were being used in tissue cultures around the world. Known contaminated products. Identical to the French infusing their hemophiliacs with known contaminated AIDS products. Well, this seriously undermines uh, um, a respect for, your, for people who have a position of responsibility in the community. I mean, I, if I had to trust somebody, it would certainly be my, my doctor, my physician, now, doctors, an average doctor doesn't have any knowledge of these events. He's totally uh, not knowledgeable about these events. I mean, the average doctor works in his office, sees patients in his office in the hospital. He doesn't have any idea what goes into growing a tissue culture or viral replication or genetic engineering, use of restriction enzymes, a host of different things that have come into play in the last 20 or 30 years. The average doctor is totally unaware of all that. Now they, are, they don't study this, they don't... Uh, they don't study it, they're not required to study it, and it's a field that's, in a sense, foreign to them. They're sim they simply, if they're given something to give to hemophiliacs or... They give it, right, it. They, right. The same as, you know, in a sense, you're implicating every doctor in France who gave the product, unknowingly uh, s believed he's the... he trusted the wrong person in a sense. That's the problem. Uh, the doctor made the trust, uh, put his trust in the wrong place. And I don't know how that trial came out where they have recently, you know, put on trial for murder basically several of those physicians who knowingly transfused AIDS virus into hemophiliacs in France. Uh, I don't know how that trial has I been know. settled. I know it's been going on for, and I think it's finally ended, but I don't know what the final verdict was. That would be serious. Malpractice, I would say. Well, it was more than uh, they were on trial for murder. It was more than malpractice. It was a criminal case. Um, some of the general rules of retrovirology are that there are about 99 cases supporting each case of the disease. Right, in general, right. For every case you see, there should be 99 or so, 100 cases subclinical. So. At least 50 to 100 is the ratio usually used. Now how many, how many AIDS? Well, with 200, 200,000 200, cases of AIDS in the United States today would put that at between 10 and 20 million people infected with the virus, which is probably the correct number. Between 10 and 20 million people in the U.S. probably have AIDS infection today, not the one to one and a half million, which is constantly used by the CDC and has been since 1985 or so. They've used that figure since 1985? Right. If you go back, you review the literature since 1985 to present, which is six or seven years, they always have stated one to one and a half million people infected, which would mean that nobody got infected since 85, which I personally find a little bit, you know, suspicious. Um, one of two things is wrong. Either they were wrong in 1985 when they said there were one to one and a half million people infected, which I've never seen that number retracted, or they've been wrong when they say that nobody's gotten infected since then. Yeah, it sounds a little fishy to me, too. Um, what, at what rate does AIDS increase? I mean, yeah, the number of cases have been doubling every year to every two years in the United States. So within the next, the next uh, four to eight years, then, of course, you would see... Uh, eight, four to eight hundred thousand cases. Of course, that would mean if there's only one million people infected by the night, by the year two thousand, everybody who has the disease will uh, be evident. And after that, a year or two later, they'll all be dead, and then it will be over. The disease will die out. I don't personally find that ridiculous. I don't think that's possible. Um, there's a 
just scary, scary statistics. It's very, uh, um, it sounds like we need to do something and we need to do it quick. Of course, yeah. Also, if you have a million cases, you only got between 50 and 100 million infected. If those numbers continue to hold up. Who stands the most to gain from, from all these? Uh, no one that I can tell. I don't see anyone really gaining from it. Um, uh, again, that gets into the question of who did what where. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to state exactly what occurred. Is there a number on how many uh, viral types there are? On yeah, it's four to the nine thousand power which is an extremely large number. That's for the AIDS virus by itself. That was one of the first things that told us that they that weren't just spoofing, but they were out and out lying, because if you read the literature, they talk about the virus more or less as if it was just a single virus, but in fact, it's not. It's a swarm. It's a menagerie of viruses which constitute the AIDS virus by itself. And that menagerie is, is comprised of four to the 9,000 power different AIDS viruses. Billions and billions and billions of viruses constitute AIDS by itself. So, uh, well, how different would each one of these be from the other? I mean, would they're different by basically o maybe only one codon or one uh, base pair change, because there are nine thousand base pairs approximately that constitute the virus, and so there are four choices for each base pair, which means there are four to the nine thousand power different choices possible for the virus. Obviously, some of those don't work but many of them do and so you have to account for billions and billions and billions of different viruses when you're making a virus vaccine or institute itself once the virus was eliminated and that I don't know because I think it depends upon how far the virus has destroyed the immune system it's clear that T cells accounts can go very low and then reconstitute themselves because they do that with various other viral diseases particularly with mono or measles or a host of different virus diseases it's known that they can virtually drop your t-counts down into the teens but then the body reconstitutes itself and t-cell counts return now the question is can that same phenomena occur with aids and well what i wanted to find out was if um so therefore you the contention is that if the physics of an uh, electromagnetic or a um, laser-oriented therapy mm -hmm. uh, could bring up the T cell counts and, and truly eradicate the Well, body. the question is, will it eradicate the virus first off, which I think that it will if it's developed. And then the question would be, could the body recover that's been affected, has been, uh, in a sense, affected and almost help spread the disease. So uh, I don't personally see, short of a out-and-out -out cure, um, that this disease will be eradicated. And this disease has the potential to exterminate mankind, the AIDS virus by itself, without considering any of its relatives, all of which have equal potential. So we're looking at uh, viruses a host of viruses, each of which has the potential to exterminate mankind. So they must be cured. I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody has that answer. Um, well, of course, one of the interesting questions would be, where do these T-cell accounts, where do the T-cells regenerate from um, in a grown adult where thymic tissue is supposedly remnant or destroyed, where are the T cells being matured? Where do they well, get there? Um, well, just the thymus, the thymus <coughs> gland is, is the place where the, the T cells are originally. Right, but those are supposed to, the thymus is supposed to involute and be, you know, virtually non-existent in adults. So in adults, where do T cells mature and gain their T cell maturation, their characteristics, if the thymus is gone, in a sense? That's one of the questions I think needs answering. Well, do you feel that there will ever be an eradication of AIDS? No, not, not the rate we're going. Everything that's been done has been done uh, simply fosters the spread of this disease, and we've done nothing whatsoever to control it. In fact, every, ver every measure for control of this epidemic, in my opinion, has been set aside, and every measure...